In this video, I'm going to be showing you how to build an awesome gaming PC around a $1,200 budget, featuring a 3060 Ti, 12th gen Core i5 and plenty of other great hardware. Let's do this. Gigabyte Z690 motherboard range provides some of the latest features and best connectivity support for the new Intel 12th gen CPU lineup. From high-end boards which support DDR5 memory and PCIe Gen 5 to more entry-level DDR4 and Gen 4 designs. The range includes boards for all form factors, catering for a wide range of builds. Check out the full Aorus, Aero and UD board lineup at the first links below and power your build with a new Gigabyte Z690 motherboard today. Now what we're going to do is run through all of the parts and assemble the system as we go. We'll start off with some of the more core components like the processor, the motherboard and our CPU cooler first off and progress onto the case, GPU and power supply later. In particular, the CPU in this build that I've selected is the Intel Core i5-12400. Now this is a really great budget CPU, the 12400F is a great shout too, that just ditches the inbuilt graphics. With six of Intel's new performance cores and a maximum boost clock speed of 4.4 gigahertz with hyperthreading, it ticks the multi and the single threaded boxes nicely. A game like CSGO with singular fast clock speeds is gonna work great, while a cyberpunk that requires more threads for its usage is going to swallow up our i5 nicely too. Now to pair up this CPU we of course need one of the latest motherboards and you've got a few options you can go Z690 or B660 and that's where this Gigabyte DS3H comes in. In particular this board has what they call their AX functionality meaning it's got Wi-Fi and Bluetooth built in and of course runs on the new and much upgraded Intel B660 chipset. Compared to the previous gen B560 this board actually has overclocking support for both the memory and the CPU that complements an already solid feature set with four RAM DIMM slots for dual channel memory performance, some more beefed up VRM cooling and a rear IO that includes all the haunts, USB-C, Ethernet, Wi-Fi, it ticks all of those boxes. To install the processor into the motherboard you need to grab your chip itself and locate the golden triangle. You can see on our processor it's just up here. You want to match this up with the bottom corner of your CPU socket where you'll also find a corresponding triangle. Pull the arm on the CPU socket up, the socket will then spread itself out nicely which will enable us to drop the CPU nice and gently into place. Give it a little bit of a wiggle, make sure it's seated properly, there we go, and pop the cover back down. Apply a bit of pressure and the black plastic cover will pop nicely off, then fasten your arm down. These new sockets are more delicate than the old ones, so just be careful. With the processor in, next up is the memory, and for this build I've picked XPG's Spectrix D45G. The gaming spin-off of famous memory and DRAM and SSD brand Adata, this kit is going to work nicely, and a wide variety of speeds will work well. 3200 is probably where I'd aim, this kit comes in very slightly quicker though, 3600, never a bad thing. You want to grab your random and locate the notch on the gold contact strip. You'll see it's actually slightly off center and this will correlate with the dim slot on your motherboard. What you're going to want to do is line it up with the second and fourth dims. That's the gray ones on our motherboard. The black dims are for if we're adding in extra randoms later on. Line it up, slide it into place, apply a bit of pressure, and it will click in nice and easily. Those clips should snap automatically back up. You haven't got to do this yourself. Slow motion replay. Once we've done that, we can move on to the SSD. And for this build, I've picked up XPG's Spectrix S20G, a Gen 3 drive with some pretty decent speeds that you can find a full review over on geekawatt.com. Plus, it has a built-in heat spreader to keep the drive cool and capacities that don't break the bank relative to how much storage you're getting. One terabyte for some people won't be quite enough, so a hard drive or an additional SATA SSD is where you want to position things if you need just a little bit more storage. Now, this step is it's a bit more complicated because you're going to ditch your large full-size normal screwdriver in favor of one of these a teeny tiny screwdriver which we'll be using to install our m.2 drive go ahead and locate this teeny tiny screw and use the appropriately small size screwdriver to remove it this should come pre-installed in your motherboard but spares also are located in the motherboard box 
box. Find your SSD, line this up in the slot, and don't pop it in completely straight. Pop it in kind of at a downward angle, and then push the drive down. You'll notice it won't go all the way down on its own. That's where the screw we just removed came in. It's gonna fasten and hold the drive into place, but a hand yoga was required there and make sure it doesn't go anywhere. After that, it's installed. Power, data, everything the SSD needs is aptly provided by the motherboard. But we're not quite finished. Normally at this stage, CPU, memory, SSD, are we all done? Not quite, because we've got this to pop in, our CPU cooler. Now this right here is Cooler Master's Hyper 212 RGB Black Edition. Quite possibly the best $30, give or take, that you'll ever spend. We recently looked at how a cooler can impact performance, and the Hyper 212 gives serious gains over the stock cooler. There are use cases where a stock cooler is a better option, but in a build like this, $30 is not exactly breaking the bank, and I'd recommend picking up a more sophisticated cooler. In order to do so, there's a few key steps to follow. First, you need to get a backplate and add silver posts onto each corner in this configuration. The skeleton side of the backplate, the other side is solid, should be facing the rear of the motherboard. Once this is done, you can grab your board itself and you should be able to see there's four holes just here. What we're gonna do is we're gonna drop the backplate through those holes. It might take a little bit of wiggling to get into place, but in the end, you'll get there. There we have it, nice and flush. Then flip your motherboard back round, slide it back onto your motherboard box, keeping that backplate in place. And you'll see we've now got four silver posts just poking through the motherboard. After that, you need to grab these. Now these right here are some female to female posts that will not only keep the backplate attached to the motherboard, but also provide a basis for us to install the cooler from. Screw these on top of the motherboard now. You then want to pick up some thermal paste. A tube will come included with your cooler, but I've got a fresh set that I'm just gonna dab onto the processor. A large grain of rice will do it. Don't worry if it looks a bit messy like that, it's still gonna work for all intensive purposes. Finally, you can grab the cooler itself and you can see we've gone ahead and installed the correct brackets for an Intel mounting situation. And then it's a really simple case of grabbing your cooler, gently slotting this onto your CPU, and all of those screws will then line up with the corresponding standoffs. That looks like a wobbly mess right now, but let me actually screw it in, you'll see what I mean, and it will feel nice and secure. A good test here is that you should be able to sort of tuck on the cooler and it should hold the whole motherboard assembly nice and firm. I'm sure the action of doing this is gonna trigger a few people, but trust me, it will be fine if your cooler is installed correctly. Now then, once that's done, well, I think we need a bit of a tidy up because things are getting a bit messy. And then we can move on and install the motherboard into the case choice for this build. For this build, I've picked to go for the NZXT H510 Flow. This is an airflow version of the famous H510, H510 Elite lineup. And honestly, it's a great choice for a build like this. And it isn't too expensive either. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna lay the case down flat on the table. This is something that I tend to do with all of our builds because it just makes the next stage of the process a little bit easier. You might also just be able to see here as well a couple of RGB fans that I've sneakily installed into the chassis to give it a bit more wow factor as it is a bit bland otherwise. I'll link some good, cheap, moderate and more expensive RGB fan options in the description below though. With this case being a full-size ATX chassis, all of the standoffs, these are the posts that hold the motherboard in place, should be in the right locations, but it doesn't hurt to double check. So here are all the standoffs on the motherboard, three along the top, three along the middle, and three across the bottom. And then in our case, let's grab a screwdriver and start pointing them out, shall we? One at the top, two, three, they're all good. Three along the middle, and then three across the bottom. Crucially, we wanna make sure that these holes are empty. There shouldn't be any extra standoffs whatsoever. If there's extra standoffs in this area, they'll hit the bottom of the motherboard and can cause significant damage. So this is something to really take your time with if you're a first time builder. Basically, the only posts that should be there are the ones that the motherboard actually needs. And that's pretty much it. And once this is all done, we can pick our case up. There's a few screws knocking about in there and spin it round because the next step is the installation of the power supply. Now this right here is Be Quiet's Pure Power 11, a 600 watt unit with an 80 plus gold certification. It's nice and silent as well, which kind of fits within the name, right? And it has enough wattage for our CPU, memory, graphics card, all that good stuff. This unit actually features a semi-modular design, meaning that the CPU and motherboard power connectors are already pre-installed. 
We just need to add in a couple of our own, which includes one six plus two pin PCIe power connector and a SATA power connection. These are gonna really nicely power up the drives and the GPU choice in this build. Of course, we've got no old style SATA SSDs or hard drives, but what we do have is some RGB fans and the controller for those does use a SATA power connection. So go ahead and pop these into place like so, spin the case around nice and easily and slide the PSU into the bottom rear with a fan facing down orientation. Proceed by screwing the power supply in in all four corners. You can see we've got one screw and two screw. And we're gonna then round things off by adding in our third in the top right hand corner and fourth screw in the bottom left hand corner. Lovely stuff. Spin your case around, which will enable you to install the motherboard power connection up to this top right hand side and CPU power connector to the top left hand side too. Nice and easy. Just to wrap things up, we're also gonna deal with the front panel connectors at this stage, which includes our USB 3.0 connector on the case, USB-C connection. This one's kind of the bulkiest of all of them and a bit more inflexible. HD audio, which goes to the bottom left of the motherboard, and our JFP1 power and reset switches, which plug up to the top right-hand side. These are all the cables that make our IO work without a problem and make sure the PC actually turns on first time, which is, after all, the most important part. And with that in the bag, we we can move on to the final component, the graphics card. And today I've picked up Gigabyte's RTX 3060 Ti Eagle OC. Now this right here is a really nice GPU when it comes to gaming at 1080 and 1440p. It's far better value than the 3070 and worth the slight price hike over something like a 3060. It delivers serious power and we recently reviewed this over on our website, which you can check out in the card section now. Fundamentally, this is a really great card that will work well for this build and I've been impressed with its performance and MSRP price point. GPU prices by the way are falling and you might be able to buy them at MSRP very soon. We've talked about it in a recent video, it's not clickbait, go and check it out. I'm feeling positive about this kind of stuff now. Now what we need to do is we need to line up the GPU with the PCI slot on the motherboard, the grey one at the very top, and that will tell us which slots we need to install it into. By the looks of things, it looks like the PCI lanes already missing from our case from a previous build are actually in the right place. So we can just shuffle this little cover back and then we should be able to slide the GPU in. At least that's the theory. There we go, it's nicely lined up. Apply a bit of pressure and it'll clip into place. Fasten it down with a few screws, give it some power and the GPU is installed, plugged up and juiced ready to go. And with that, we're basically done. Pop the fan onto your CPU cooler and plug that up and the build is ready to go. I'm gonna boot this up to see how good it looks when it's all powered up and of course the performance, which we'll look at in the montage and the gaming benchmarks that you're about to see. I'll see you in a second, but first roll that montage. Fantastic. Now that we've seen just how good the system looks when it's all powered up, you guys know what's coming next. It's time to check out the benchmarks. We're gonna dive into quite a bit of detail title by title, but before that, check out this summary on your screen now of all the different results we were able to gather. These include our GPU and CPU temperatures, which I was fairly impressed with, even if they were a touch high for an airflow oriented case. Let's start off by looking at GTA 5 in more detail and work through our other titles, including Battle Battlefield, Fortnite, Apex, COD, and more. At 1440p in Grand Theft Auto 5, we managed to pull in 135 FPS on average, with 123 and 107 for the 90 and 99th percentile results. The game at 1440p looks great, and truth be told, dropping down to 1080p isn't going to gain you that much more frame rate. These are already some fantastic results that I was really chuffed with. But what about Battlefield 2042? Well, at 1440p high settings, with DLSS enabled, we managed to pull in 94 frames per second. Whenever DLSS is available in a game, we always tend to use it. This is of course Nvidia's AI backed resolution scaler and will certainly help us increase our FPS on the performance front. Visually the game looked great as you'd expect and Battlefield 2042 is quite an intense title, so numbers that I was impressed with here. Moving on to Call of Duty's Vanguard next up, here we tested at 1440p high once again with DLSS enabled. 
We managed to bring in 166 frames per second on average, just about enough frame rate to satisfy those high refresh rate 165 hertz monitors, while 90 and 99th numbers were strong too, indicating some very stable frame rates overall. Moving on to Forza Horizon 5 next up at 1440p ultra settings, we ran the games in built benchmarking mode and managed to achieve 93 frames per second on average. 90 and 99th percentile results were good too, the game looked great and performed very well as is to be expected. But the good results don't end there. In Halo Infinite, our next title, the numbers were once again very strong. 1440p high settings, we got 98 FPS. And let me tell you, those frame rate numbers don't lie. All of our FPS testing was done with both MSI Afterburners Reaver Tuner and Nvidia FrameView to maximize fairness. Moving on to some more esports titles next then, Apex Legends at 1440p is the first of those games. We managed to bring in more than 120 frames per second at 1440p high settings. You'll easily head towards the 200 mark if you look into game at 1080p or of course medium to low settings. A game where you definitely don't need to scale the resolution or the visual fidelity down is Valorant as our next title on the list gave us some insane numbers. 340 frames per second maxed out at 1440p. Valorant is really, really good when it comes to performance if you've got a solid GPU and CPU. So to see such great results here was awesome. The game visually looked great as well, which always helps and didn't disappoint in the FPS department. Talking of titles that don't disappoint in the FPS department, Fortnite. 1080p competitive settings, yes we test the game out with everything tuned down to low, but the render distance set to far, for maximum possible FPS. We pulled in 232 frames per second. Oh my goodness. It's gonna cost you the best part of $500 to buy a monitor that can even show this many frames. So the numbers for me were absolutely spot on. Finally, to wrap things up, we also tested out Call of Duty's Warzone. A bit of an oldie but a goldie at this point, 1440p high settings, DLSS once again enabled, we got 124 FPS on average. Not quite as good as our 230 something in Fortnite, but nevertheless a strong result that showed this system's resolve when it comes to gaming at 1440p. And with that, that pretty much wraps it up for this one. If you enjoyed it, make sure to get subscribed. Thanks for watching, and as always, we'll see you in the next one.